Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up. All controls triple-checked. Motors heated. For they face cold as extreme as 60 below. Unrelenting. Murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here, too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulses spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice, Detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane. Gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration. Just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea, as well as on it. Shelf ice, Bird leads his four planes in the long climb over pressure ridge areas, heading for the polar plateau, 10,000 feet up. Below are no landing fields, only deep crevasses. Pressure ridge is 100 feet high, instant destruction for a plane forced down. Bird pioneered the first South Pole flight in 1929. He applies again the practice of constant vigilance, careful calculations that assured his earlier successes. Over this cruel country, Bird flies today at three miles a minute. In earlier explorations, three miles in one day was frequently the utmost for Shackleton and Scott for Britain, Amundsen for Norway, and Bird himself for America. The Beardmore Glacier, 200 miles long, 50 wide, a thousand feet deep, who knows? Bird checks position by the sun compass. The glacier signals the South Pole itself. Here, Bird drops the flags of the United Nations, carefully boxed a symbol of America's goodwill to all nations. Now beyond the pole, Bird focuses his cameras and magnetic detectors on land new to him and to all mankind. Commander David E. Bunker wipes his frosted windshield, a constant source of trouble in polar flying. He is over the Shackleton Ice Shelf, named for the great English explorer who kept returning to the Antarctic until death so often escaped, kept its rendezvous with him. The smooth shelf roughens, dark rocks, called nunataks, appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Birds' planes deep into the unknown are the eyes of civilization, recording, evaluating, mapping. Plateaus, mountain ranges with peaks 20,000 feet above sea level. The trimetrigon lenses clicking overlapping exposures every three seconds photograph from horizon to horizon. Coal, a mountain of coal. Bird later declares Antarctic mines, if once tapped, could supply the world's coal needs for centuries. These official motion pictures can give only a cross-section of the miles of photographic records accumulated on this expedition by the Navy. The exposed mapping film will take five years to assemble. Amplifying these are the radar magnetic detectors, accurately recording mineral discoveries of immense value for the future use of all mankind. England, Norway, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South American countries, and Soviet Russia are claiming Antarctic territory. The United
United States recognizes no claim and so far has made no formal claims for itself. But international policies cannot concern the Admiral now. His duty is to keep his flying laboratories functioning, to fulfill his dream of a lifetime. The word gas half gone, sir, comes from the engineer tabulating fuel tank readings. Bird radios his pilots, return to base. By the third leg of their triangular course, the planes head back for Little America. Bird's plane takes the widest swing fuel permits as the lenses of the TriMets continue recording new territory. This is the last big flight. Bird is determined to record the maximum possible. One by one, the planes swing in over Tent City. Flight operations checks them in and safely down. Plane two, plane three, plane four. But not plane one. Bird's plane is yet to be accounted for. Bird is missing. appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bunger leans forward in amazement. His eyes have caught a sudden and unbelievable change in scenery. The universal white has turned to chocolate brown dotted with blue. A cameraman goes into action. 300 square miles of land without snow. Land that might be in New Mexico or Arizona. Pictures alone will prove Bunger has discovered a warm oasis in the shadow of the pole. It is for such supreme moments as this that men brave the hardships of exploration. The astounding, undreamed-of fact is that they are over a chain of warm water lakes whose shores, except for small patches, are free of ice and snow. Commander Bunger circles the largest lake in sight, five miles long. He comes in to make a landing. Water temperatures must be recorded. Sample was taken. He finds the water fresh, the temperature 38 degrees Fahrenheit. On the shores are vast deposits of coal and of minerals of the utmost importance to civilization. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur, CBS News correspondent, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek Magazine. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yes. unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. This is a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, do you hope to see that? I do. <laughs> Well, Admiral, yeah. would you say that uh, since you've been to the both the extremities of Earth, are these expeditions to such far off places, are they getting easier because of modern techniques or is, still, is danger still close at hand? Well, it's a little risky, but nothing like it used to be with the old slow planes. 
and the small cruising radius where we had to put down bases. And we replaced the dog teams, and of course that was a big improvement. But now the planes go much faster, and they are safer, and they have a much bigger cruising radius. You haven't got the danger of a terribly heavy load. Mm -hmm. Admiral, a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA, and it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back, and upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, at the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole, because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the uh, bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And, uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula, we'll say? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. I've then between it, there and Cape Horn. I've heard it said that uh, there are seven continents in the world, and one of them has never been seen by a woman, and that's Antarctica. Is that actually true? Well, if the power position is an island, as far as I know, that's true. No woman's ever stepped foot upon the Antarctic continent, and it's the most peaceful place in the world. Well, I'm <laughs> sure that won't last very long. Uh, <coughs> today, I understand that now that you're working with the, uh, the Arnold Bread Company in charge of frozen foods now. Is there any future for frozen foods down these frozen extremities? Well, I think the uh, human race can be helped uh, by that. Uh, this was thought out by... Dean Arnold, who's, uh, in my opinion, the great humanitarian, he uh, learned that we went down there after four or five years and finished a meal that we had left there on the table when we had evacuated Little America. Everything was perfect, including the bread. So he got the idea of this frozen bread, and already we sent some to, he sent some to Europe and just very, worked very well over there for the, some of the starving people. That's so so you can store it down in the Antarctic and against the lean years and you wouldn't have any people in the world really starving if you did that. Yes, in the event of an atomic war... You stay there forever. Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains it's not covered with snow, enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world 
They are by far the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make Joey this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Well, Admiral Byrd, are yeah. private expeditions a thing of the past? Is, it, is expedition and exploration, making expedition and exploration now a purely a government function because uh, of the tremendous no, cost organization? No, I don't think so. I think down south, it may be more or less a thing of the past, but not other other expeditions that go there. A lot of them going off now. This latest expedition now on the way is a government expedition, I take it. Yes, that's the government. Have a bear, may I ask you, is there a great difference between the uh, top of the world and the bottom of the world? Uh, the there is. Now, uh, the North Pole is the center of an ocean 10,000 feet deep. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by um, continents that are slightly frozen. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice, frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now, the south is a plateau. It gets, in some places, 14,000 feet up. Uh, I've been over areas about 13,000, and it's a little bit chilly up there. So there's, uh, there's that big difference between the top and bottom of the world. I don't, con the north really isn't very cold up there on the Arctic Ocean. Not compared to the south. Admiral Byrd, we often hear it said that our young Americans now aren't as hardy as their forefathers. Do you think that Americans do measure up to the standards, uh, the physical standards and morale standards of the past? I do. I don't believe that. I think they're just as hardy. Well, what would you say was the most uh, valuable factor on expedition? Is it uh, morale, or uh, physical courage, or is it uh, sheer equipment? Well, I've always thought that loyalty was by far the most important trait. The British told me, that when I first went down in 28, that I couldn't possibly get through the winter night without a mutiny if I took more than 20 men. But to serve science, I had to take 42 men. Then I took 56 the next time, and so on. So, and I did find that loyalty was the most important thing during the winter night when it's very hard on your nerves. Is, uh, I think that's best that's trait. Well, that's a very valuable characteristic at any time. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Byrd. It's been a um, great pleasure to have you here tonight. It's a pleasure. <laughs> is Antarctica, nearly six million square miles of ice-covered wasteland, larger than the United States and Europe combined. Less than one-third of this great continent has been explored. Previous expeditions have discovered indications of coal, iron, and other minerals in this last frontier. Its mean elevation is 6,000 feet, but some of its mountain peaks rise above 15,000 feet. 
it is the highest and coldest continent in the world. In Antarctica, scientists hope to find the answers to many questions which will unlock secrets of the universe. The International Geophysical Year is a combined effort of scientists of more than 60 nations to gain knowledge of the Earth and related phenomena by worldwide simultaneous observation. One of the most extensive of all International Geophysical Year investigations is taking place in the Antarctic region with 11 nations participating. In an effort to help find answers to these questions, the United States Antarctic Programs was conceived. And by direction of the President of the United States, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, veteran polar explorer, was named officer in charge. The Navy was assigned the task of logistic support for the program. Task Force 43 was organized under Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet to implement the operation, which was assigned the code name Operation Deep Freeze. Rear Admiral George Dufek was appointed commander, Task Force 43, with the responsibility to construct bases, operate them, supply and resupply them, and transport scientists to and from Antarctica. The major objectives of Operation Deep Freeze 1 were to establish a main IGY base near the site of the former Little Americas and an air facility at McMurdo Sound, investigate Marie Birdland and the South Pole, for suitable scientific observation posts, to support a planned U.S. scientific program in the Antarctic, and provide logistic support for the United States participation in IG-1. The USS Arneb, AKA-56, Admiral Dufek's flagship, was one of nine ships constituting Task Force 43's ship group. The others were USS Wyandotte, AKA-92, USNS Greenville Victory, USS Nesplin, AOG-55, and the icebreakers, USS Edisto, AGB-2, USS Glacier, AGB-4, and the East Wind, a Coast Guard icebreaker. And finally, two yard oilers, the YOG-70 and 34, were each loaded with 270,000 gallons of aviation fuel to be used as Antarctic filling stations for the air unit. The Task Force Air Unit, Air Development Squadron 6, commanded by Commander Gordon Abbey, consisted of two R-5D Skymasters, four R-4D Skytrains, two P-2B Neptunes, as well as four de Havilland Otters, and six HO-4S-3 helicopters carried aboard the Task Force's ships. At the Atlantic Fleet's Construction Battalion Center, Davisville, Rhode Island, a special Mobile Construction Battalion was commissioned by Admiral Dufek with Commander Herbert Whitney, commanding officer of the unit. These CBs had the responsibility of constructing all of the bases in the Antarctic. They were trained in cold weather construction. But the Antarctic, notorious for its unpredictability, will pose many problems for them. Here, Commander Whitney reads his orders, assigning him as commanding officer. Mrs. Dufek is accorded the honor of carrying old glory in the changing of the color ceremony. Miss Julia Hawks, selected by the crew as co-sponsor, representing the women who must remain behind, carried the battalion flag. Families and friends are afforded an opportunity to see some of the unique equipment that will be carried on the expedition. It's a 10,000 mile trip down there. And in three months, this weasel will be moving across the polar plateau. Junior checks it out, while mom inspects this tent. The roller will be used to build airstrips on snow-covered ice fields. A winterized portable building. This will be used on the trail for a mess hall and radio communication. 
In August 1955, the task of receiving, packaging, and loading the ships of Task Force 43 began at Davisville, Rhode Island. Here were loaded an estimated 20,000 measurement tons of cargo, bulk petroleum products, and the Antarctic life preservers, sled dogs. The first departure at Davisville in early September was marked by the excitement and sadness of farewell. Many of these families will be separated for over a year, and the separation will be spanned only by intermittent mail and wireless communication. From September until mid-November, this scene was repeated as task force ships departed from various east and west coast ports. On November 14th at Norfolk, Admiral Byrd spoke at departure ceremonies for the Arneb, Admiral Dufek's flagship. En route to polar waters, the icebreaker glacier passed through the Panama Canal, where she took aboard a load of bamboo. Later, at sea, the bamboo was cut into strips. It will be used as trail and supply dump markers in the deep snow. Other preparations for the expedition were carried on at sea. Here, sleds are being rigged. In equatorial waters, the routine was interrupted by the traditional ceremonies conducted by King Neptune and his court. The polywogs were put through the appropriate ritual of initiation required of all sailors crossing the equator for the first time. Among the Operation Deep Freeze personnel were several foreign officers. Here they inspect the Navy's newest and most powerful icebreaker. In warm tropical waters, religious services were conducted on the open deck. And on at least one occasion, the ship paused far out in the Pacific, while crew members took a dip and acquired tans that they hoped would last out the Antarctic winter. The crew of the little YOGs were deprived of many of the comforts and conveniences offered by the bigger ships. Here a line is shot to the vessel. And a high line is raked to send supplies across. Two of these vessels were towed to the Antarctic. Life aboard them was rough, wet, and lonely. Thanksgiving Day aboard the ships was celebrated in the South Pacific, far from a supermarket. But the ship's mess tables were amply provided with a traditional bird and trimming. The USS Glacier arrived at Port Littleton, New Zealand, December the 7th, 1955. Here she was joined by Captain Gerald L. Ketchum, Deputy Task Force Commander, and Admiral Byrd. On December 10th, the glacier began the final leg of its journey to Antarctica as hundreds of New Zealanders gathered at the pier to bid the ship and its crew a bon voyage. Six days later, the glacier received her baptism of ice near Scott Island when she entered the ice pack. December 18th, the task force sighted the Antarctic continent when Mount Erebus, the only known active volcano in the Antarctic, towering 13,000 feet above McMurdo Sound, came into view. The glacier moored to the ice, and its helicopter flew a survey party ashore to find an area on the bay ice suitable for a long, flat runway that would support the weight of the large planes of the air unit. Commander Abbey and Commander Whitney surveyed an 8,000-foot strip of ice at the south end of McMurdo Sound. They tested its thickness with a gas-powered chainsaw to determine if the ice would support heavy planes without skis. This site was found to be suitable. It was located immediately north of the 1902 expedition camp of Royal Navy Captain Robert Scott, leader of the second party to reach the pole. 
food stores left here by the Scott Party over a half century ago were found to be perfectly preserved and quite edible. The glacier then unloaded vehicles and materials for the establishment of a temporary base camp to support CB and air contingents until permanent buildings were completed. Some permanent inhabitants arrived to discharge their ambassadorial duties by greeting and entertaining the visiting delegation from the United States. The emperors are the best known year-round inhabitants of the Antarctic. Penguins are equipped with built-in toboggans for traveling over the snow. This Adelie penguin rookery was located less than one half mile from the glacier's moorings. With the completion of the airstrip, Captain Ketchum and party transferred to the ice to await the arrival of the Edisto. From this ship, he would direct operations in the area. The USS Edisto arrived soon after the glacier departed McMurdo Sound to furnish logistic support for air operations and construction parties. The offloading began immediately. Supplies, equipment, and materials were unloaded for transportation to the temporary camp and airstrip sites. The sled dogs were happy to be in their element and were eager to go. Surface vehicles began moving materials over the bay ice to the airstrip and permanent base site. December 20, the aircraft made their fly-in, guided along the 2,200 miles by ships stationed at 300 mile intervals. Four aircraft arrived without mishap. Headwinds forced four of the smaller aircraft to turn back to New Zealand. Aircraft have now flown non-stop from a large landmass into the Antarctic continent for the first time in history. The glacier proceeded from its ocean station to Scott Island, and on Christmas Day, rendezvoused with the other ships of the task force north of the ice pack. Rear Admiral Dupec greeted Admiral Byrd as he transferred from the Arnev to the glacier to command the transit of the task force. The mighty glacier led the column through the ice pack. Clearing the pack four days later, the task force was met by the Edisto, which led the Wyandotte and Nespelin into McMurdo Sound. The glacier escorted the Arneb and Greenville Victory on to Canaan Bay, 450 miles to the east. December 28th, the Wyandotte and Nespelin arrived in McMurdo Sound and sent a mooring party ashore to bury timbers, called dead men, for attaching the ship's mooring lines. After the long flight from New Zealand, an even more hazardous task was undertaken. Aircraft taxied 30 miles directly to the tanker Nespelin to expedite flight operations and take full advantage of the little remaining good weather. Refueling at the ship, the aircraft were on ice only four feet thick, over water 1,800 feet deep. A temporary camp was established and air operations commenced immediately. An R5D using wheels rather than skis makes a jet assist takeoff, beginning a long-range exploratory mission. In less than one month, pilots of EX-6 mapped and photographed over a million square miles of territory, never before seen by human eyes. Later, Admiral Byrd, Dr. Paul Seipel, and other Antarctic old-timers paid a visit to the site of Little America 1 and 2. They located this radio tower, built during Byrd's 1929 expedition. When first erected, it stood 75 feet above the surface of the snow. On January 4th, 1956, Little America was officially commissioned by Admiral Byrd and Admiral Dufay. The glacier, after carving out a mooring in Canaan Bay for the cargo ship, was ordered by Admiral Dufek to McMurdo Sound to assist Captain Ketchum. For 10 days, the Edisto and the Coast Guard East Wind attempted to cut a channel through the ice of McMurdo to within a reasonable distance of the base site at Hut Point. During this time, only 14 miles had been gained. The glacier went to work on the ice. It takes immense power and tons of weight to accomplish the feat of crushing acres of ice, ranging from 10 to 12 feet thick. These scenes, taken from the ice, show you the power of the glacier. An icebreaker, contrary to popular idea, does not break ice by cutting through it, but is so designed that the bow will ride up on the ice, and, in a porpoising action, 
the sheer weight of the ship crushes and cleaves through the ice. In 48 hours, she came within six miles of the base and established an offloading point and a turnaround circle. The 30-mile artery through the ice was named Glacier Channel. Since bay ice did not move out into the open sea as anticipated, it was too risky to bring the cargo ships into the channel. Therefore, the three icebreakers were required to shuttle supplies from the ships through the channel to the offloading point. Here at Glacier Point, the cargo is unloaded for transfer to the base site. The unloading operation involved a calculated risk. The glacier's cargo handling equipment, designed for only 12 tons, lowered a 24-ton V8 tractor. The risk paid off. Cargo moved the six miles to the camp, loaded in tractor trains. This operation involved many hazards because of the treacherous bay ice. Finally, on January 14th, the first load of building materials and supplies arrived at the base site, and one of the major objectives of Operation Deep Freeze had been accomplished. The indispensable glacier served not only as a cargo transport, but also as an aircraft tender. By January 18th, above freezing temperatures had caused ice runways to melt and crack. The aircraft, after receiving their final refueling and maintenance from the glacier, took off for New Zealand. 450 miles east, near Little America, supplies were shuttled to a temporary cache on bay ice, approximately halfway to the base. The warm weather caused melting and weakening of the ice, until finally, the temporary cache was in danger. Admiral Dufek ordered everything transported to the firmer shelf ice on the double. Every available tractor, carry lift, and helicopter was pressed into use. Within 48 hours, all of the cargo had been moved to Little America 5. Only a short time before the bay ice broke up and floated out to sea. In the construction of bases, the CBs lived up to their can-do reputation. With the building area leveled, foundations were laid for the special type buildings, which would be the living, operating, and recreational facilities for a long, long winter night. Floors were laid and walls erected. They look thin, but special insulation and expert construction make them snow tight. Roofs must be especially strong to support the heavy accumulation of snow throughout the three years occupancy. Tractors cleared the area between the buildings of snow and ice so a tunnel system could be built. An elaborate tunnel system was built to connect all of the buildings and serve as storage spaces. Both here and at McMurdo Sound, 250,000 gallon fuel tanks were constructed to serve as storage for aviation fuel to be used in Operation Deep Freeze 2. When completed, these tanks were filled from the USS Nesplin moored about four miles away. The problem of transporting fuel four miles was met by using several collapsible fuel hose storage tanks provided by the Marine Corps. This tank, when unrolled and filled, holds 10,000 gallons. Gasoline was pumped to these tanks and by increasing the pressure at booster stations with auxiliary pumps, was finally brought to the huge fuel tank at Hut Point through portable pipelines. This experimental crevasse detector, designed to give a signal when a crevasse was approached, proved not completely reliable when used by trail parties. The loss of an otter supporting aircraft and the failure of the crevasse detector delayed the Marie Birdland trail expedition. With winter weather setting in, the project was postponed until Deep Freeze 2. To climax the activities of Operation Deep Freeze 1, the glacier with Admiral Dufek aboard made a notable cruise around the Antarctic continent. The purpose of this voyage was to locate suitable sites for more IGY stations to be established in later operations. Survey crews returning from surveying a possible site on the Knox Coast experienced the sudden fury of an Antarctic blizzard, a vanguard of the fast approaching polar winter. 
their small craft fought through the icy seas to the side of the glacier and was finally hoisted safely aboard. The glacier's cruise around the continent brought Deep Freeze One to a successful conclusion, and she pointed her bow northward, leaving behind 73 men at the Little America base and 93 sailors and scientists at the Naval Air Facility in McMurdo Sound. With the wintering over party were 1,500 tons of supplies and materials to sustain them through the coming year of isolation from the rest of the world. Some of these materials will go into the construction of bases at the South Pole and Marie Birdland before ships return to the Antarctic. At the base of Observatory Hill, men prepared for the bitter cold and the violent winds of the long winter night. And at sea, the glacier plunged northward into warmer, ice-free waters. Her destination, the United States, where she would be fitted out for Operation Deep Freeze 2.